Sorry. Good evening and welcome to tonight's public meeting of the 2019 New York City Charter Revision Commission. I'm Gail Benjamin, the chair of the commission, and I am joined by the following commission members. Uh, Commissioner Member Albanese, Commissioner Member Camillo, Commissioner Member Karras, Commissioner Member Fiella, Commissioner Member Gavin, Commissioner Member Green, Commissioner Member Miller, Commissioner Member Nuri, Commissioner Member Tisch, Commissioner Member Vaca, and Commissioner Member Weisbrod. With those members present, we have a quorum. Before we begin, I will entertain a motion to adopt the minutes of the Commission's meeting held on June 18th here at City Hall, a copy of which has been provided to all of the commissioners. Do I hear a motion? Second? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. What?
Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me, please. Excuse me, please. Excuse me, please. Excuse me, please. You have had an opportunity to present to us. Don't point your finger at me. You have an, had an opportunity to speak. You've had an opportunity. I am, no. I am going to declare a brief recess of the meeting. And if we cannot get control of the room, then I am going to have the room cleared. Thank you very much. This meeting is in recess at this moment.
I'm calling this meeting to order. Over the past year, the Commission has engaged in a robust and comprehensive examination of the entire city charter and a thoughtful deliberation of various ideas and amendments to it. As I have emphasized throughout our public meetings, as the city's foundational governing document, the charter plays a vitally important role in establishing the structures and processes of city government, which in turn affect many aspects of our daily life. It has been our task to evaluate how the current charter has performed since it was largely put into place in 1989 and to identify areas in which improvements should be made in order to best serve the city for the next 30 years. Today, the Commission will vote on whether to, p to place five ballot questions encompassing various amendments to the Charter before the voters at the general election this November. I am very proud of the proposals that the Commission has developed. I believe they represent very important and impactful changes in five areas of city government that we have heard a lot of concerns and ideas for improvements about over the last year. Elections, the CCRB, ethics and governance, the city budget, and land use. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Commission staff whose work and support have been valuable to us throughout the process. I would also like to thank all of the staff at the various institutions which have hosted us for public hearings throughout the past year for all of their assistance, including Lehman College, Medgar Evers College, Queensboro Hall, the College of Staten Island, M Borough of Manhattan Community College, the P Jamaica Performing Arts Center, Brooklyn Borough Hall, and of course, here at City Hall. On behalf of the entire commission, I would like to thank all of the New Yorkers who took the time to share your ideas, whether at hearings or online. Your ideas and feedback were immensely valuable as we undertook this important and daunting task. We sincerely hope that you felt this process allowed for meaningful and productive engagement, even if we were not able and did not do all that you may have asked. Finally, I would like to thank my fellow commissioners for your service and for the important and valuable perspective and insight you have each brought to this process. Let us proceed with the business of today's member, today's meeting. Commissioners, you have before you a series of documents, all of which have been posted on the Commission's website, including a summary of the proposals as well as the text of the ballot questions, explanatory abstracts, and the text of the proposed charter amendments. I will now describe the, puzzle, the proposals that are before us. Okay, I'm going to read this quickly. Um, question one, elections. The proposed amendments would establish ranked choice voting in primary and special elections for the offices of mayor, public advocate, controller, board president, and council members. Up to five candidates could be ranked. This would apply to primary and special elections on and after January 1st, 2021. Extend the time to hold special elections after a city office is left vacant to 80 days in order to accommodate state and federal laws relating to military voting and early voting. Amend the timetable for the redistricting of all council districts to ensure that boundaries are established in a timely manner for 2023 primary council elections. Question two, CCRB. Amend the structure of the CCRB by adding two members, one from the public advocate and a joint appointment by the mayor and the council who would serve as chair and provide that the council directly appoint its members to the board. Require the police commissioner to provide a detailed explanation to the CCRB when deciding to impose discipline on an officer which differs from the level of discipline recommended by either the CCRB or the NYPD deputy commissioner of trials. Allow the CCRB board to delegate its subpoena power to the executive director. Allow the CCRB to investigate potentially false official statements made by an officer it is investigating and to recommend discipline 
if appropriate. I was going to read. Question, provide a minimum budget to CCRB sufficient to fund CCRB staff equal to 0.65% of the number of uniformed police officers unless the mayor determines that fiscal necessity requires a lower budget. Question three, ethics and government, governance. Extend the post-employment appearance ban for elected officials and certain senior appointed officials from one year to two years for employees officials who leave city service on or after January 1st, 2022. Amend the structure of COIB by replacing two members appointed by the mayor with one member appointed by the controller and one appointed by the public advocate and updating the quorum requirements. Limit the political activity of COI board members by prohibiting participation in campaigns for local elected offices and reducing the maximum amount of money they can contribute to the amounts that candidates can receive from those doing business with the city, $400 or less, depending on the office. Require that the city wide MWBE director report directly to the mayor and be supported by a mayoral office of MWBE. Require advice and consent by the city council for the mayor's appointment of the corporation council. Question four, city budget. Allow the city to use a rainy day fund to save money for use in future years. Changes to state law will also be needed for the rainy day fund to be usable. Set guaranteed minimum budgets for the public advocate and borough presidents at or above their respective FY 2020 budgets adjusted in future fiscal years by the lower of inflation or the percentage change in the city's total expense budget, unless the mayor determines that fiscal necessity requires a lower budget. Require the mayor to submit the revenue estimate to city council by April 26th instead of June 5th. The mayor would be able to update the fiscal estimate after that date, but if the updates submitted after April 25th, the mayor must explain why the updated estimate was fiscally necessary. Require the mayor to submit budget modifications to the council within 30 days after submission of any periodic update to the city's financial plan. A question number five, land use, provide a ULER pre-certification notice period by requiring the Department of City Planning to transmit a detailed project summary of ULERP applications to the affected community board, borough president and borough board at least 30 days before the application is certified for public review and to post that summary on its website. Provide community boards with additional time to review ULERP applications certified for public review by the Department of City Planning between June 1st and July 15th from the current 60-day review period to 90 days for applications certified in June and to 75 days for applications certified between July 1st and July 15th. Those are the proposals. I would like to entertain a motion to approve the ballot questions, abstracts, and proposed charter amendments that we have before us. Second? Any discussion? Uh, Sal? Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd like to have, uh, I have an amendment to the ethics and governance uh, proposal regarding the two-year ban on um, elected officials from lobbying. Uh, before I get to that, I'd just like to get some legal clarification about the uh, CCRB investigating potentially false official statements. Uh, the, the two questions that I have uh, are, one, uh, what happens if there's legal, if there's credible evidence that a police officer uh, didn't intentionally make a false statement? And the second one is what happens if a police officer uh, makes a false statement regarding a, uh, an issue that has nothing to do with the investigation? Um, what are those? If the, the, the can, can, can I have legal Council, please clarify that. Your first question relates to inadvertent false statements. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, uh, th there's credible evidence that a police officer uh, who made a false statement did not do it intentionally. It was an inadvertent false statement. What, how? If there's credible evidence, how, how is that addressed? 
The proposed language um, relates only to material official statements. So if a statement was not material, it would not be covered by the proposal. And it has to relate to the FATO complaint. Yes, and then the second question you had was, does that answer your question, your first question? Um, sort of, what, what, let's go to the second one. Okay, so the second question was, how does the proposal handle an alleged false statement that's made that doesn't relate to the complaint? Correct. The proposal, I'm quoting, says uh, it covers only uh, statements that are, quote, made during the course of and in relation to the board's resolution of the applicable complaint. So if it's not related, obviously it's not, it's not something that's considered a, a problem for the officer, is, is that related to, if it's not related to the complaint. The, the, the additional jurisdiction being granted to CCRB by this proposal. It has to be related to the investigation. For, okay. It has to be related to the board's resolution of the complaint. Okay, great. So uh, in, terms of, in terms of credible evidence of not, of making a false statement, there's credible evidence that wasn't intentional, that would obviously not be material, correct? So it wouldn't be an issue. Well, can, can I, I, I actually was, was understanding it, whether or not it's material is probably a, a different threshold, but the point is the materiality is a trigger to investigate the false state, the potential false statement, but they still investigate the false statement and presumably if they determine that there was credible evidence that it was a mistake or inadvertent or what have you, it would impact how CCRB might decide to recommend or not recommend discipline, right? Isn't, isn't that how it would work? Yes. Okay, that's, it's important to clarify that and I appreciate it. Uh, let's, let's go on to my... Uh, Wait one second, Lindsay, did you have something else? No, I was just... Lindsay, Lindsay helped to clarify. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, on the post-employment the post appearance ban, uh, which I think is a modest improvement in terms of what I call the, the revolving door, uh, I have a problem with, with it being effective January 1st, 2022. Most of the proposals that will, will go before the public have, have an effective date if they're adopted, of January 1st, 2020. Why is this proposal different? And, and one, of the, one, of the, one of the issues that was raised, which I find uh, is really uh, ironic, is that the, the elected officials that are in office today got elected under the old rules. Well, that's the essence of the problem. What we're trying to do is prevent prevent the revolving door, where elected officials leave government and immediately trade on their government experience and become lobbyists. And if, if these folks are thinking about the rules, that's an indictment of their public service. Um, the, the fact is that uh, today, just today, the Times Union wrote an editorial calling for a lobbying ban of a lifetime for elected officials and for uh, uh, high officials and you know presidential candidates are also uh, making some of these pronouncements. We've had people across the aisles condemning the revolving door, which which really affects public policy. Um, and I'm proposing here a very modest ban. My 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 ideal is a lifetime ban. I proposed a five-year ban. I settled for a two-year ban. That's going to be on the ballot. Uh, but I, I really have a problem with, with, with this January 22 uh, date. Uh, we, we, uh, we saw the Charter Revision Commission, the past Revision Commission, pass a campaign finance law, uh, an addendum to the financing of campaigns for mainly political insiders, and then the City Council added to that. They added more money, of more public funding, and it took effect immediately. It's interesting. Why didn't it take effect in 2022. Why? Because it benefited the people that are in office today. I, 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 I just don't understand why this exemption exists on this proposal. 
And I think, I actually think that political insiders got to, uh, got their way here, and I, I, I'm, I'm, in, I say let's amend it, and let's take effect, let, let it take effect January 2020, with the rest of the proposals that we're that we're entertaining. So I, I'm making a motion to make the two-year ban effective on January 2020 if the public adopts it. I'll, I'll second the uh, motion for the same reasons Council Member Albany cited. Um, I would uh, say first that um, there are a variety of different dates. Um, only a few are January 2020, there's January 2021, there's 2022, there's March 2020, there's July 6, 2020. Um, but so I would say there are a variety of dates about when these would become effective based on the, the circumstances of each item. I would also say that as a former government employee um, who was held to this standard, that we are near the end of a large turnover in government, including the mayor, the comptroller, 30-odd council members, um, and that to do this at this point in time, I think, could potentially, this is the Gail Benjamin opinion, um, could potentially lead to disorder in government, that it would be very hard if people decided to leave before then to find replacements for high-level government officials. In 2022, all of, uh, all of those elected officials will be leaving, government will be turning over in the natural course of events, and I think that's the appropriate time to institute such a change. Any further discussion? Call the question. Uh, Madam Chair, I mean, I, I, I just don't, I mean, I understand your perspective here, but I, I totally disagree with it. I mean, this, this is a good government measure, and, and you're saying, you're framing it as it's a bad government measure. The, the, I haven't framed it that way. That's how you've heard it, but the question is being called, I believe. Okay. Call the question. Commissioner Albanese? Y yes. Commissioner Camillo? Abstain. Commissioner Karras. Abstain. Commissioner Fayala. Aye. Commissioner Gavin. No. Commissioner Green. No. Commissioner Miller. Abstain. Commissioner Nori? No. Commissioner Tisch? No. Commissioner Vaca? No. Commissioner Weisbrod? No. Chair Benjamin? No. Two in the affirmative, seven in the ne negative, three abstentions. The motion fails. Are there any, is there any further discussion? Point of uh, clarification, further discussion on the questions overall or on this matter? No, on the questions overall. Yeah, I'd like to address uh, the, uh, one issue, Madam Chair. Council Member Fiella? If I could ask you all to, uh, I think it's page 140, it relates to amending the charter, chapter 58, by adding a new section. This deals specifically with the rainy day fund. As you all know, I've written you, spoken to you individually, and spoken throughout these hearings the last year on this was my number one priority. I've been fighting for 20 years for this. I really want to applaud you, Madam Chair, and the members for being the first commission to actually uh, take it under consideration and have it put in the staff report, and then to have language included in this final report. However, I think it's important upon reading uh, the very simple language that was crafted to understand the following. Um, what we're doing 
is issuing a statement of position. The people in November will vote yay or nay on this ballot question, this bucket of ballot questions. With respect to the rainy day fund, they are either affirming they want or don't want a rainy day fund. The language as constructed says the city may maintain, this is page 140, uh, proposed section 1528, revenue stabilization fund. The city may maintain a revenue stabilization fund as a year-to-year -year reserve account subject to the New York State Financial Emergency Act for the City of New York as amended from time to time or any successor statute. Each fund shall be created and operated in accordance with any applicable state law. Innocuous enough. Uh, I've, I've approached legislating in life under the mantra of the good shouldn't be the enemy of the perfect. Um, I've also said to you all, I'm used to being on the losing side. I've been voted down more times in this chamber, not by this charter commission, but my past life in this chamber than anybody else here. I'm used to it. But uh, I want to make you all aware of something. This language isn't good. It's not perfect, but it's not good enough. I'm not looking for perfect because we're not divine. We should pursue good, and we should make sure that good is as good as it can be. Toward that end, and because this question is largely framing a plebiscite on the concept of a rainy day fund, which will set up discussions between New York City government and Albany policymakers, I think it's important that this body be clear on its intent. I tried, as you know, to put parameters in, parameters with respect to deposits and withdrawals and the circumstances under which those would be made. Through individual discussions, I understand that that was a non-starter uh, for you. I wanted to do something about the Health Stabilization Reserve Fund. Uh, individually, I was told that would be a non-starter. I understand how legislatures work. A compromise is important, but clarity and precision of language in the bills itself are paramount. So what I'd like to propose is not the parameters, but rather a very clear statement on what our intent is. So if you look at that sentence, the city may maintain a revenue stabilization fund to serve as year-to-year -year reserve account, well, that doesn't really provide for intent. Our intent is to do what? To make sure that in an economic downturn or a severe emergency, there are assets in place that fund can be dipped into, money's taken out, and help to stabilize the city during those downturns. It is not meant to be a piggy bank for profligate spending during good times. So I do urge us to provide for the following language change. It says the city may maintain a revenue stabilization fund. I think may should be shall. The big distinction between may and shall legally, we know that. But I would like to strike year to year reserve and I'd like the sentence, I'd like you all to consider this very precise language. The city shall maintain a revenue stabilization fund, we've all agreed to that, to serve as a reserves fund account only to be used during economic downturns or severe emergency. That doesn't provide for parameters that I wanted in it, but it does make a clear statement of what our intentions were, and in the future, when future mayors and, and speakers are... Could you repeat are, are, that again so sure. I can write it down? The city shall maintain... I have that part. ...a revenue stabilization fund to serve as a reserve funds account. This is the important language. Only to be used during economic downturns or severe emergency. Future policymakers should know what our intent is and the voters should be absolutely certain that we were looking to create a rainy day fund, not a slush fund that could be, through creative uh, financiers and lawyers, dipped into. So I put that language forward and I would ask uh, for someone to please second it. I second it. Okay. 
Any discussion? I, I just wanted to observe that in the write-up, it does refer very much to what you just said. You were looking at the big document. The explanation in the ballot question is much closer to what you had said. I understand, Commissioner. Okay. The problem is that won't be the language in the charter. The charter language should be in, should state intent. I would ask also that my memo to you all be included in our final, not the report, but in the final materials, because I spelled out in great detail uh, this subject matter. But I think the I, I, I agree with you, Commissioner. I just want to make sure, though, that the language, that's the only thing that will survive, quite frankly, uh, speaks to intent. So it's the charter language. The charter language, the actual language that's being voted upon. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I seconded the motion because, um, first of all, I do think that most of us would assume that a rainy day fund would be used during economic downturn, but I don't want to leave that as an assumption, and I think that Council, uh, Commissioner Fayella, his wording gets to that. Um, also, there is a very big difference between shall and may. Um, the last Charter Revision Commission stated that community boards may hire a city planner. And of course, then the city gave them no money to hire a city planner, so they never hired city planners. There's a big difference. And um, I, I think that we discussed this, and we did all agree that we wanted a rainy day fund and uh, with state legislation, which I understand is required. But I think that the intent of the commission was to go forth with a rainy day fund. Thank you, Councilmember Vaca. Is there? Excuse me, Councilmember, uh, not Councilmember. Um, <laughs> Commission uh, Member Karras. I actually agree with uh, Commissioner Fiala on the general intent, or at least my general intent. Uh, I had said at the last meeting that I didn't think there should be parameters for putting money in. But I also didn't think it should be just a, an account to take money out of. But I have real concerns about us putting language in now. Uh, again, the same reason I abstained uh, on Commissioner uh, Albanese. Albanese's, uh, because we haven't discussed the possible unintended consequences. And I fear, you know, uh, just to come up with an example I can think of, you know, uh, the federal administration takes a huge chunk of aid out of New York City. Is that an emergency? Is that a disaster? You know, there, there could be situations that may not be complicated and we're going to be stuck with sort of unvetted language and I'm very reluctant to do that uh, at this point. Uh, I, I Council was, Member uh, Green? I also wanted to no, ask a, a clarifying question. I mean, the, the the charter amendment language specifically refers to the existing state act and, and says it has to be amended. Are, are, are the, I don't know that state act as well as you do. Obviously, I don't know if any of us do. But aren't there provisions of that that would have to enshrine in state law or require subsequent local legislation or rulemaking or something that would get at those details that you're talking about? Thank you for that question, uh, Commissioner. Uh, and I think it's important for all of the commissioners. We should understand what we're doing here. This is simply a plebiscite that will provide the mayor and the city council with ammunition to go up to Albany, and this would require a change. What that ultimate language will be in the state law, I have no idea, but what I'm trying to get at is that the plebiscite of the people expresses very clearly that we want a rainy day fund so we don't have massive tax cuts during downturns and massive service cuts during downturns. It's about preserving those services. So 
the language, there's a heightened necessity to have the language be precise because it provides the moral fodder that I think the local leaders going to Albany should have. It should be wind at their back. But from a legal standpoint, and I thank those that have spoken, I thank Commissioner Vaca, thank you for your point, because I, I think you realize that the legislative bodies, five years from now, you know, someone will say, well, we don't know what you all meant. A reserve fund is a reserve fund. Well, we have those now. The whole purpose of what we were trying to achieve with the rainy day fund was to deal with economic downturns specifically. That was the only reason for this. It's, and I'll tell you, just like my borough empowerment thing, this is innocuous, folks. This is innocuous. It's a statement of values. That's all it is. It doesn't guarantee an outcome. Are there any other? I would like to call a question. And I would just add that I think, I understand what you're saying, and I think we have expressed that intent in the report itself, as uh, uh, Paula pointed out. I'm, I agree with Jim that I'm not sure about the unintended language consequences. Um, so I am going to vote in the negative, but I would also say that I would ask staff to take a look at whether there's some way we can take a look and do something more between now and August 5th. Thank you. Carl? Carl? Uh, yes, I'd like to um, associate myself with uh, comments by Commissioner Karras and also by the chair. As uh, Commissioner Fiala well knows, I was an earlier, early and enthusiastic supporter of uh, the Rainy Day Fund and believe it's very important. And I um, am delighted that we um, have agreed to include a, a proposal to have a ra Rainy Day Fund among our proposals. I am extremely uncomfortable about amending the language uh, before us on this, at, at this time uh, when we have 12 commissioners each weighing in on language that we have not seen before today, before 20, or heard of before half an hour ago, 20 minutes ago. Uh, and have not had an opportunity to reflect on. So I'm also going to vote no, but I appreciate what the chair is saying, which is if this can be clarified before this goes to the voters and tightened up in a way that um, uh, makes clear what is the intent of, uh, uh, of this commission. And I agree with uh, Commissioner Fiala that it has been the intent to create a uh, a, a rainy day fund, and I also recognize that irrespective of what we do here, this is still subject to state legislation. Um, but I do think the intent, as Commissioner Ga Gavin indicated uh, in our report, is clear. I think the, what the commission itself wants to do is clear, and if the language can be tightened appropriately after being vetted by council. Um, I, I think that would be a good idea, but I'm not, certainly not prepared to do it at this time. Commissioner Karras? I just want to, I just had a conversation with staff. I had had a question about why we subjected it to state law. And I was just talking with our executive director. And the reason we subjected it to state law is because state law does have parameters for taking money out. Uh, so I, I don't, A, I don't think we can put language in there that, you know, to, to say extreme emergency when state law actually lists several reasons. I don't think we can do that. And the truth is, that is in there by the reference to state. It has to be operated in accordance with state law. So I actually think substantively what you're, what you're asking for is in there. And uh, since the abstract reflects that, I, I sort of think we're 95 percent there. But uh, Jim, I love you. <laughs> I don't agree with you or the staff. The state, the state, state funds are uh, 
It's funny how everyone in this chamber likes to say, if the state would follow the city, the state would be better off. <laughs> now we're saying, let's follow the state. I just don't, I don't agree with the, the staff's assessment on that, nor do we know ultimately what it would look like. But I understand where we're at, and I appreciate everybody's comments. So, uh, oh. Call the question. Is there a second? Second. Was, that was an amendment, was it not? Yes. That you offered? It, yeah. Yes. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, on Commissioner Fiala's amendment. Commissioner Albanese. Yes. Commissioner Camillo. No. Commissioner Karras. No. Commissioner Fiala. Yes. Commissioner Gavin. Commissioner Green. No. Commissioner Miller. No. Commissioner Norrie. No. Commissioner Tisch. Uh, yes. Commissioner Vaca. Yes. Commissioner Weisbrod. No. Chair Benjamin. No. Four in the affirmative, eight in the negative. The motion fails. Is there any further discussion? Then I ask the council to please call the roll on resolution one. Please restate our resolution one. I recommend an I vote for those of you who are interested in what I recommend. Before the commission is the set of five proposed questions, abstracts, and proposal language. All five questions collectively. Commissioner Albanese. I'll pass. Commissioner Camillo. Yes on all, uh, except I will abstain on the post-employment appearance ban, question number three. She's abstaining on the post-employment ban um, because she would be personally affected, or could be. So I'm clear. You're voting yes on all of question three except for the portion of the question that relates to post-employment restrictions. Is that correct? Yes. Commissioner Karras. I want to thank the chair and the staff and the entire commission. I think this was not an easy process. I think it was a, a great process in terms of how we all came to this with really different ideas and really different focus areas. And we, we uh, the chair and all of us had to work together and the staff had to pull us together. So I, I just want to uh, thank them, uh, and I vote yes. Commissioner Fiala. I vote aye on all except the following proposals. You're going by proposal number? Is that right? That works. I will, I will describe it after you've done it to make sure I have it right. No on proposal four. No one proposal. That's the structure of the CCRB? That's correct. No one proposal seven, false statements. No one proposal eight, guaranteed budget. Where is that? Where are the numbers? Aye on all others. He's just calling a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You know, he's voting here. But these are you're considering it all as one. The whole thing.
Um, I'm going to take one commissioner out of order. I know that she has a um, something very important to do. Um, Commissioner Tisch, I would like to take you out of order and allow you to be excused to vote on all matters before us today. I too uh, would like to thank the staff. I think you have been wonderful. You've been professional. You've been organized. You've taken a lot of incoming and you've done just a superb job. And you are all talented young individuals with big careers ahead of you. I would like to thank Chair Benjamin and my fellow commissioners. Thank you. You have been a pleasure to work with. And I would like to vote yes on the entire bundle, except for I'd like to accuse myself on question two. Thank you. And just so we make this abundantly clear, you're, we're also taking you out of turn to vote on question two. And uh, we would ask that you sign the report. Before we move on, Commissioner File, I want to make sure I recorded everything correctly. You voted yes on all, with the exception of um, question uh, two relating to the CCRB, to the, ex the portions that uh, provide for a minimum CCRB budget, affect the structure of the CCRB, and provide for the false statements language. Is that correct? Thank you. Commissioner Gavin. I too want to, sorry, this is important to be loud. Um, I too want to commend the staff for their diligence, commitment, and quite honestly, incredible expertise and hard work. And I would like to thank my fellow commissioners for loving this city and being passionate about so many important issues. And I vote absolutely yes. Commissioner Green. Uh, I vote yes on everything and echo the uh, gratitude and appreciation for everyone's hard work and commitment, including those of you who've attended all of our meetings and hearings. Commissioner Miller. Yes. Commissioner Nori. Yes. Commissioner Vaca. I want to commend the staff for their diligence, professionalism, and always um, being in contact with commissioners who have questions, getting back to us. And I know that their research meant so much to our work. I do want to say that I think the main accomplishment of our commission will be ranked choice voting. I think this is a major election reform for the city of New York. And I think that uh, the witnesses we've had certainly were persuasive in that regard. And um, it's a reform that I think will serve our city well and maximize voter participation. But we do have an engagement component that we have to pursue. And we do have time to do that. But certainly, we have to educate voters as to this system. And uh, I stand ready to do so. Um, and I thank all my colleagues who I respect and who I like so much, and I want to say that this is an experience for me. Uh, it's an experience serving on this commission, and this experience I've had is going to be very hard to replicate again, I'm sure. I'll leave it at that. It will be hard, because uh, government is always evolving, and I'm sure there'll be a need for additional charter revision commissions going forth. So I vote aye on all except on number seven uh, pertaining to false official statements. Commissioner Weisbrod. Um, I would 
really like to join with my colleagues in thanking the staff for really uh, doing an excellent and objective job in a very uh, complicated and um, uh, e extremely uh, difficult situation. Uh, they really uh, out outperformed, I think, all, every expectation and really did a, just an excellent job. And, and of course, I also especially appreciate the role of the chair uh, who um, managed and herded and um, uh, blended us all together and uh, and the work and thoughts and and views of all of my fellow commissioners. I, I would just say that um, I have uh, uh, worked and lived in this city my entire life and I think every member of this commission has a great love for this city and recognizes that it is the greatest city in the world and that it is so important for this city to be able to function at a very high level um, and meet the needs of uh, our really proudly pluralistic um, city, uh, pluralistic in so many ways, but not the least of which is pluralistic in our views on how government should function. And so um, I, I think this commission really demonstrated that um, um, everyone here has that same commitment. I'd also really like to say a word about um, the speaker who uh, created this commission because it really is the first commission uh, that has been created by other than the mayor and did it uh, by uh, uh, having uh, appointees from the broad uh, uh, spectrum of city government from all the borough-wide and city-wide elected officials. And I think that in and of itself is unique. And the fact that we could all uh, come together with different views, different perspectives, and have come up with recommendations that I do think will advance the city is really a remarkable accomplishment. And um, uh, I give Speaker Johnson, who probably went into this with some um, doubt about whether that goal could be accomplished, um, credit for, for, for taking that chance. And so um, I uh, very, very uh, enthusiastically vote yes on all of these. Commissioner Albanese. Uh, I, I too want to commend the staff for their hard work uh, and their uh, responsiveness whenever questions were raised. So I want to, once again, uh, good job staff. It, this was not an easy task. Uh, I, uh, I vote aye on all with the exception of uh, the uh, fourth statement uh, proposal under question two. Chair Benjamin. Aye on all. The motion carries by a vote of 12 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions with exceptions that I will read in just a moment. And while they're tabulating before they announce the vote, I um, would also just say you have before you, in addition, a draft of the final report of the commission 
as well as the resolution that directs and authorizes the Commission staff to take appropriate actions to deliver all necessary materials to the City Clerk in order for the approved ballot questions to be placed before the voters at the general election on November 5th, 2019. I would like to note that a vote in favor of the final report and resolution means that the report and resolution accurately reflect the will of the Commission as a whole and that the previous vote on the ballot proposals themselves, of course, remains a part of the record of the Commission. Therefore, I ask and encourage a yes vote from everyone on, the, on this motion. Um, as soon as they tabulate and announce the results, I will call the question on this matter, and then we will have a vote on that. City Clerk and the Board of Elections, um, and if we don't get it there by then in the exact form, then there is no. Um, and then um, September 5th, I guess, is when um, early ballots go out, can go out uh, for early voting. Um, but yeah, what happens for us here? After August 5th, um, we're having a public a education right. campaign. Staff can only do education, and they're doing subway campaign. They're doing And the tabulation results are? Question one, question four, and question five were adopted by a vote of 12 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, zero abstentions. Question two, relating to the CCRB, was adopted by a vote of 10 in the affirmative, one in the negative, one abstention for the structure of CCRB component, the minimum CCRB budget component, by a vote of 11 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and one abstention for the variance memorandum and subpoena power components, and by a vote of eight in the affirmative, three in the negative, and one abstention for the false statements component. And question three, relating to ethics and governance, was adopted by a vote of 12 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, zero abstentions for all components with the exception of the post-employment ban component, which was approved by a vote of 11 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and one abstention. The net result is that all five questions have been approved by the commission. Thank you, everyone. That was one for the record books. Um, <laughs> do I hear a motion? as we discussed earlier. Is there a motion for the final report and resolution? Second? Discussion? If not, um, I would ask the council to call the roll. Commissioner Albanese. Yes. Commissioner Camillo? Yes. Commissioner Karras? Yes. Commissioner Fayala? Aye. Commissioner Gavin? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Miller? Yes. Commissioner Nori? Yes. Commissioner Vaca? Yes. Commissioner Weisbrod? Yes. Chair Benjamin? Yes. 
I voted 12 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions. The motion carries. The resolution and final report are approved. Before you leave, commissioners, um, please see the council because you need to sign the resolution that's been adopted. And Jim Karras has also just asked for some time, um, and he would like to discuss a matter. Yes, I just comment. I uh, had been pushing hard for a provision to require a review of the budget structure uh, with a view towards creating more units of appropriation. Uh, I know staff worked really hard on a proposal. Uh, we actually instructed staff at the last meeting to draft something. They worked very hard on it. The more I worked on it, the more I became convinced it was necessary. We actually have agencies in the budget uh, that are supposed to have programmatic units of appropriation. They have two units of appropriation, one for staff and one for everything else. I don't see how staff and everything else are programmatic. Uh, Today, uh, the administration and the council did uh, agree that we would work on a, uh, a consensus methodology for reviewing all of the units of appropriation in the budget. Uh, it will be done outside of the charter process. So while I'm disappointed that we couldn't put something in the charter process, I'm heartened that that work will continue. I also think, you know, I think these proposals that we've adopted are really uh, going to make city government better, more accountable, more responsive to people. I think other things will come out of this. Uh, the units of appropriation thing being one sort of wonky thing. I, I suspect some legislation, uh, some work on comprehensive planning will also come out of this. So I think the work that we did, both what was put into uh, the final report as well as what, uh, you know, other things that grow from that uh, will really improve the city. So that's it. Thank you, Jim. Um, I would like to just uh, Lindsay and then uh, Paula. Um, I wanted to just emphasize that I know we've agreed to a post-action report, uh, and you might have had that in your final comments, but I think that is important because there were several issues, democracy vouchers, borough president conversations, pension fund, and strategic planning, my favorite. Um, and so I, I just wanted to have on record that we are going to have a post-action report. That is correct. Um, and I, I just wanted to, to confirm that I had heard the same thing. I know I was often speaking up on wonky and technical budget things, but I know that there's a commitment on the uh, on, on both sides to keep working on the on unit of appropriation issue. So, yes, um, I had made that commitment before that we would have a post-action report. I'm not sure the form it will take yet, but anybody who is is interested in it, we will be sending things out in the future. And if you are interested and intrigued. Uh, we can certainly have more discussions about how it would be structured and what it will say. Sal? Yeah, I just want to uh, update everyone. As most of you know, uh, I think we, we whiffed on the democracy voucher proposal because uh, I think that's the most significant reform for the city. But, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to hear that, uh, that we had a good number of people that supported it, uh, and there, there will be... Uh, more work done on it. Uh, and I also want to point out that one of the arguments that was raised about democracy vouchers was the legality of it because it was challenged in, uh, in Washington, uh, the Seattle proposal. And uh, that decision's in. It was unanimously approved by uh, the Supreme Court in Washington. So uh, the legal challenge is no longer an issue, at least uh, at the state level. Thank you, Sal. I would like to take a minute to thank all of the commissioners who have served, those who are here today and those who could not make it today. I think I have been, I am very grateful and I have been very lucky um, that the elected officials who chose each one of you chose you. I think you have all added immensely to the work that was done and to the final result. Uh, I know that we have not always agreed. 
um, sometimes vehemently, sometimes quietly, but I have a tremendous amount of respect for each and every one of you and for your contribution, not just to the meeting today or to the meetings that we've had, but to the many, many discussions, the reading, the meeting with people, the meeting with me, uh, the meeting with other members of the commission, the gauging of your principles um, against the proposals that were in front of us. And I really appreciate it. It has been a long, but it will be a cherished experience. It is not over. As you know, um, there will be an election in November, and this will be on the ballot. Um, and there's not a lot that's going to be on the ballot with it. We are going to have to excuse the colloquialism, but gin up interest in getting people to come out. Um, as many of you know, there is uh, an, a corporation council directive that staff cannot be involved in other than educational efforts on behalf of the ballot. And in the last charter revision, that is why you saw the just flip the ballot. If there is any other discussion about why this is desirable, it would have to come from us, the commissioners, or from surrogates out there who were interested in these topics and want to make sure that we have an educated electorate who we are primed and interested and excited about these possible changes because if that does not happen, all of this work is for nothing. So if any of you are willing to do any of that work, I know that Joanne in Indiana will be calling you and reaching out to you. For all of you who have not read it, Satish has already started for us and he has an editorial that was in the paper today. Um, so, Satish, do you want to, there. I, I think it's moot now, but <laughs> if you want to check it out, it's, uh, it's in the Daily News. Oh, I didn't see it. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, as I said, before you leave today, please see our council and sign the resolution if you have not done so. With that, the business of today's meeting has been concluded. Um, as special thanks for each of you, we have brought you to your a lovely little Charter of Vision Commission 2019 tote bag um, for your personal use, and um, you can tell the world you were part of it. Um, Indiana reminds me that you may, they can for, take the folders this time. you may for the first time take your folders <laughs> and your name tag. We will not be using them again. Now, may I have a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The motion carries. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it.